try a different key. Good morning. Would you please stand and join us as we begin our worship in song? Father, we are here to worship you, and Lord, thank you for bringing us here. What a beautiful day to come and celebrate you in our lives. So Lord, we'd ask a blessing upon this time in Jesus' name, amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. We've got just a few announcements to make. If you uh, take a look at your bulletin, there's an insert, and it's the uh, missions report. And so you'll want to read through that and see what our church is doing in the ways of uh, missions. And then uh, in your bulletin, there's a little tear-out piece, so I'd ask you to tear that out. Any prayer requests or change of address or new phone number, uh, put that on and, and put it in the offering bags at the end of service. Our shoebox ministry is going forward. We're going to be packing boxes towards the end of this month and getting those ready, and then we'll have them displayed up front here. And so uh, that's a great opportunity to be in a ministry that uh, our church fully supports. Uh, the life chain is today at 2 o'clock. We're going to meet behind um, um, Banner Bank in the parking lot there, and we'll have posters, an opportunity to go and stand on 395 and just pray for uh, sanctity of life and uh, that opportunity to uh, show support for the cause. And so we'll be um, out on 395 from 2.30 to 3.30, so come and join us for that. Um, if you look down on the scheduled events, you can kind of see what's, what's going on in the life of the church. One of the things I noticed wasn't there was a uh, youth group is at 6 o'clock, and they're meeting over at our house just down the street a couple houses from, uh, from here. And so um, if you have someone that's junior high age, so that would be like a middle schooler to high school, uh, send them over to our place on Thursday night at 6. And then the women's group is going to start meeting. And Molly, where are you at? Can you raise your hand, Molly? Really high, so people can see. Okay, right there. So Molly's leading the women's group, and they're going to meet at 10 o'clock um, a.m. Tuesday mornings here at the church. And they'll meet in the foyer area or the back of the sanctuary, come in through the front doors, and uh, be a part of that women's study. And I really don't have any other announcements other than there's a budget meeting uh, tonight or this afternoon right after service so if you're part of the budget committee please uh, come and be a part of that. Dan if you would come and lead us in scripture. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is 
It is Sanctity of Life Sunday today, so uh, we have a, John's got a special message for us today, and it is the life chain today, and we're going to be reading out of Psalm 139, so I'm going to read the whole psalm. Uh, this is Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I, t- if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. (coughs) Uh, We're also going to pray this morning for, uh, there were five boys, maybe many of you heard that, local community boys here that uh, were involved in a car wreck. And um, a couple of the boys are still in pretty serious condition. So, uh, the community has really rallied, and I know John and Scott participated, and I think somebody else participated in a kind of a community uh, vigil for them on Thursday, and um, and then there was a car wash, I think, and they did a car wash yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the community is kind of really kind of yeah. <laughs> By the youth, yeah. yeah. And John yeah, so. was able to share the gospel with about 300 from our community yeah. Thursday night. So. so anyway, we just need to keep these boys in prayer and, um, and, and that God would use these events for the gospel. And so we'll pray for that. We're also going to pray for our president today and, uh, and then for the life chain too today. Let's pray. Father, uh, we just thank you. We thank you that um, it is Sanctity of Life Sunday and we do... Um, we praise you that we um, have the freedom uh, that we can uh, celebrate that life is in fact sacred as uh, David has taught us in your, in your word in Psalm 139. Father, you formed us, uh, formed our inward parts in, in the womb. And um, Father, we know that you are the source of life, that uh, life is sacred because of that, because you are the one who gives it. And so... Um, Father, we just pray for the life chain today that um, uh, as people stand and, and sort of spread themselves out along the sidewalks on both sides of 395, that you would, um, that we would be respectful and that, uh, Father, it would just be a testament to your word that, um, that we might stand up for the rights of the unborn and uh, just for life, the sanctity of life in general. Father, we also remember these boys that were involved in a car wreck, and um, Father, for two in particular who are 
uh, still in quite serious condition. Father, we pray for doctors and, and uh, just for your healing hand upon them. And uh, Father, we thank you that uh, that during this uh, vigil that they had on Thursday, Father, that the gospel was shared. And so, Father, even though these events are tragic, we pray that you would, uh, in your sovereign way, use them for your purposes and that the gospel would go forth and that people would hear uh, the good news and that there is hope uh, in, in, even in this life where tragic things happen. There is hope. And uh, Father, we also do remember our president today and uh, all those in, in leadership. Um, there's just uh, many things to pray for in that regard. And uh, Father, we pray for wisdom, for leadership, and Father, we pray for truth, that uh, ultimately truth would prevail. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you may notice that we have a different piano this week. And if you could have told me last Sunday that we would have a different piano by this, this Sunday, I would not have believed it. Um, for a lot of years, the piano that we've had, um, we've had it for 22 years. It has served us well. And... Um, well, it didn't match the TVs. That's the real reason. That's, why I was, that's a joke. It, um, we have had it worked on and worked on and worked on to try to maximize. Um, the touch was goofy and you couldn't play soft on it. It just wasn't there. And never played in the upper registers because they were really um, tinny and harsh. And we have had pads replaced on it, worked on it um, repeatedly. And it just finally, the piano technician maybe a year or so ago said this one is just not getting any better. This is, is it's reached its potential. Um, so I had had kind of a dream for a long time to replace this piano and I'd mentioned it to a few people and they're like, what's wrong with the brown one? It's pretty, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, until a few people over the last year or two have come up and said to me, what on earth is wrong with that piano? And so some hear it, some don't. Um, so we, just two months ago, sent an email just like, perhaps someone would like to give toward a new piano. It's not coming out of the church budget. It's not coming out of what you give in your offering. And um, in two months, we had exactly what we needed. We traded in the Howard, and this one is 21 years old. It's, um, it's just a real blessing. It needs to be tuned. It sits here for a few weeks after being moved, so um, it will only get better from here, and um, we're just really blessed. It's a real first world luxury. It, you can't eat it, and it doesn't keep you warm. It's like we don't need it, but it's sure a blessing, and for those who gave, um, some gave large amounts, some gave small amounts, and it's all just a real beautiful um, gift. And I just pray that this piano will be a blessing to all of us for probably about 80 more years is kind of its lifespan. 20, they live about 100 years, more or less. So anyway, this morning I'm going to play a song for you to kind of break it in. And it's a song that I chose because it's a soft and a quiet song that I never would have dared even try to play on the other piano. So take my life and let it be.
Yeah, that's right. I can tell a difference. Well, today is a celebration of sanctity of life. I'd rather call it a right to life for the unborn. It gets more to the point of what we're facing today. So remember the scripture that uh, Dan just read about uh, God forming us in our inmost being and, and uh, in secret and so forth? There's a Chinese proverb that says, and I quote this from ta a Table Talk magazine, if you want to know what water is, don't ask the fish. The reason you don't ask the fish is because the water is the sum and substance of the world in which the fish is immersed. It does not ponder long enough to reflect on its own environment until suddenly it is thrust out onto dry land and struggling for life. Then it realizes what the water really was and what it provided for its substance. Well, that's kind of where we find ourselves today in the culture in this country. In the 60s, there was a change starting. We had revolutions in the colleges and so forth. Vietnam War and protests all over the place. It continued on 30 years ago and then the last 10 years especially, lots of things have come to be an issue. So, so we are in a sense immersed in that environment and fail to take those ramifications seriously. So all of a sudden we are thrust into this humanistic worldview in which we now live and we ponder where is it going and how did this happen? Whole denominations are facing divisions of some sort because of the struggles that's happening. Southern Baptist Convention is now battling between critical race theory. Should it be taught in seminaries, which is the liberal side of that denomination think they should, ha should be, and of course the conservatives are against that. I foresee maybe a division coming in, in that denomination, but who knows, only God knows. So abortion is one of those issues. 55 years, 56 years ago in 1964, which is the same year I married my first wife, was when the famous Roe versus Wade ruling was passed making abortion legal. And now I find abortion as a, being a top topic in this year's presidential election. Primarily, most liberals are okay with abortion. Even there is a significant amount of conservatives, even in the church, are okay with abortion. We have become like the fish. So I'm going to share with you a very personal experience of what I went through in deciding about abortion. I have not shared this with anybody else except recently with my oldest daughter and Gail has known this for some time. Our family in 1980 was my first wife Margie, oldest daughter of 15 years, Sally. And at that time we were enjoying uh, Sally's time in high school, attending all the band concerts, marching band parades, piano concerts, church youth group, and of course, all the football and basketball games where she played in the a pep band. So I was even enjoying some boyfriends that we invited, her friends we invited over for after the games to have um, snack time and so forth and play games. So I was felt free to challenge them to ping pong, which of course I beat the socks off of them. Well, Saturday, one Saturday morning in January, and I was always in charge of fixing breakfast on Saturday mornings, eggs of some sort, bacon, sausage, French toast, and lots of hot syrup as my men's group on Wednesday mornings know. And my wife came downstairs and sat down. I could tell something was not quite right with her. And she suddenly announced, I have some news. A little bit of a pause, I'm pregnant. 
sort of like a bombshell, since that was not really planned to happen, although I knew that there certainly was a possibility. Well, a month went by, uh, went by and Margie sat down with me one evening and told me she was bothered about something. And she had a talk with her gyne gynecologist and they discussed women who got pregnant later in life. At her age, there was a higher chance of having a child with Down syndrome and maybe some other abnormalities. And she was struggling with that because he gave her an option of abortion. And she was thinking about that and really struggling with that. So up to that point, we were against abortion. But now we're faced with that situation of, what do we do? In the society that we're in, if abortion was legal, so forth. And so I prayed to God that he would give us an answer. And it was a, it was a stressful time that during that time. She had the doctor make an appointment at OHSU in Portland where they could, would do an ultrasound and take a sample of the fluid in the embryonic sac, I assume. So we went up there and we both watched the ultrasound and, and the little three-month baby, old baby who had arms and legs, a head, and was wiggling all around. I thought she even, or he even smiled at us. We both went home in awe of what we saw. Saw a baby as part of us. So the test would not come back for a week, but that was on a Monday night. Wednesdays we always went to church for prayer meeting and so forth. So we went there and the pastor always has a midweek sermon on top of that. Well, for some reason, only God knows, he chose a subject on abortion and preached through several passages. It was a very anti-abortion and pro-life sermon. So he always gave his altar call at the end of his sermons. Uh, pertains to what he was preaching about. So we both got up immediately and walked up to the altar and knelt and prayed. Could not go, hold back our tears. <clears throat> so we prayed a prayer of repentance, asking God to forgive us for those thoughts we've been having. But Jesus said, even, the, even you think about those things, you have committed the sin, a sin. So we got up uh, totally humble before God, resolved to, to carry on and uh, have this baby in and be joyful about it. Well, Tess came back, it was normal. And then we would have another little daughter which was an answer to my wife's prayer. She was, wasn't really settled on having a little boy. A little daughter was great. <laughs> Our first daughter was a piece of cake to craze. She never was in any trouble. And the, the only thing she did afterward, she told us afterwards that after we closed the bedroom door at night, she would hop up and down her bed. It's the only thing she ever did that I knew of that was bad. But the story does not end there. At eight months into her pregnancy, about two to three weeks before she was due, she woke me up in the very wee hours in the morning, told me she was bleeding. And I didn't know how serious it was, but apparently she did because she called the lady close friend next door who was an RN and worked in the hospital, knew what was going on. So she came over and we put her in the car and off they went to the hospital, emergency room and I stayed home and I'd come in a little later, which I did. I got to the hospital as they were out, and they were out of the emergency room. Margie was in the ICU, the baby was in the incubator. As I found out later, both came very near to dying. The nurse came over to me in the waiting room and says, uh, we need to fill out, finish filling out the birth certificate and we need a name. Well, fortunately we already picked out several names to choose from and I chose the name. Katie Annie, after my grandmother Yoder and my mother Annie. Now, if we had aborted that baby, the little girl, we'd have missed raising a headstrong but very talented little girl. She played the piano at five years, composed several songs by the time she was eight, and then Margie died when Katie was eight years old. 
This is another story, but it's just a short version. I sent Katie to live with Sally and her husband. Sally became her mother figure, and they moved on to Moscow, Russia for six years. She learned the Russian language, got straight A's all through school, and then on into college she got, well she got a full ride scholarship to U of O, and then in college she got straight A's, even into her master's program in speech pathology, and as a lead speech pathologist in the Eugene school system, teaches a couple of night classes that she developed for the master's program in speech pathology, that's where he's at today. So that's a pretty short version of, of my experience on abortion. It was a very traumatic time uh, through that time. So that's how I'm a very ardent supporter of the right to life for the unborn. Thank you.
rejoice, let all of the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great! Father, you are great in our lives. Lord, as we come here today to celebrate what you do in our lives, we celebrate the fact that you sent us a Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, and that we've committed our lives to him. Lord, I'd ask that you'd speak to our hearts today through the word as Pastor John uh, leads us in this time of worship, this time of reflection, this time of making commitment. Lord, that our hearts would be woken that we would trust in you in all things. Things are hard, we'd see your hand working in those, and when things are good, we'd see your hand also. So Lord, open our minds with your spirit today through the word, Lord, that we'd rejoice in you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. I want to thank the worship team for leading us in worship today. They always do such an excellent job, and especially the piano players. <laughs> so, today is not Sanctity of Life Sunday. We've said that several times. It's an understandable um, confusion. It is Life Change Sunday. Sanctity of Life Sunday, I believe, is in January. But don't quote me on that. We've always emphasized Sanctity of Life this Sunday, the first Sunday in October, because of the Life Chain event, which takes place across the United States. And I don't know if it's October in every location, but it is here. And so we've latched on to that. Uh, and so there is that event this afternoon in Hermiston, and uh, as Scott announced that, and... Um, 
So I have chosen to speak today on the sanctity of life. I'm going to do that in a manner that is quite different than normal. I'm not, I don't know that I would say what I'm going to do is preaching. I don't have a specific text, for instance. I'm, I, I'm not exegeting a text and then applying it to our lives. What I'm going to do is more along the lines of a speech. I've never done this in 24 years uh, as the pastor here, and I don't recommend it as a, as a normal activity. But, you know, if you do it once every 24 years, I think it's okay. I'm going to read this to you. It's going to be shorter than normal because reading allows for precision uh, in a way that preaching sometimes uh, lacks. But also reading means that you're not embellishing as much and, and to read something through, um, you can do that more quickly. It's about, it's about nine pages uh, typed. I wrote this um, so that it could be published. I have no intention of trying to publish it. But, but that was the mindset in which I uh, went about doing this. And, and it is on the sanctity of life, but it's also related to the political issues that we find ourselves confronting at this moment. I'm not saying I'm going to read this word for word. I might embellish a bit. I, I might add a few thoughts. But I, I hope there's more light than heat in what I share with you today. Um, unlike a, a presidential debate that took place last week, which there was very little light and there was a great deal of heat. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I felt the losers in that were the American people who deserved better. They deserved a substantive debate and, and that did not happen. Um, and I think both politicians are to blame for that, although I think our president uh, is more to blame than the, than, than the other side. So, um, I've entitled this, Speaking for the Innocent Unborn, and so I begin. This nation is in the process of affirming a new Supreme Court justice as it anticipates a presidential election in one month. As we contemplate who we should vote for in this upcoming election, one of the issues that should be forefront in our minds is the importance of the Supreme Court. Elections have consequences, and the judiciary proves this. In four short years, President Trump has appointed three justices to the nine-member Supreme Court. His most recent appointment, Amy Coney Barrett, is currently awaiting confirmation by the Judiciary Committee and then the full United States Senate. If recent history is any indication, think Brett, Brett Kavanaugh, the confirmation process will be highly partisan and brutal. Judge Barrett will be replacing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died of complications from pancreatic cancer at the age of 87, and was known by her supporters as the notorious RBG. By all accounts, she was a consequential person. She is probably best remembered, at least by those on the political right, for her stalwart defense of abortion. Her commitment to abortion was wrapped up in her understanding of feminism. Speaking before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 1993, chaired by then Senator Joe Biden, amazing how these things all come together, Ginsburg stated, and I quote, it is essential to a woman's equality with man that she be the decision maker, that the choice be controlling. If you impose restraints, you are disadvantaging her because of sex. The choice Ginsburg refers to is the choice to abort the preborn baby because of an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy might disadvantage a woman's educational ambitions or career prospects, she must have the right to kill the unwanted preborn child. Her passing has generated a wide range of responses, as you can well 
imagine. Jen Hatmaker, a former evangelical and an influential voice on the religious left. How many know of whom I speak? eulogizes as follows. With a deep, deep sorrow, I honor this absolute legend. She blazed the very tr trails we walk on today. I cannot say this with more sincerity. Well done, good and faithful servant. You fought the good fight and you finished your race. Enter into your rest, dear sister. What a profound use of her earthly days until the very end. This was a true public servant, the likes of which we rarely see. May we take the baton and run our leg of the race with half the grit and faithfulness. With her unreserved praise of Justice Ginsburg's life and legacy, Hatmaker dismisses as seemingly insignificant the millions of preborn children whose existence has been snuffed out through abortion. It is as if their innocent lives count for nothing. The Supreme Court matters in this upcoming election because the nine justices who make up the court are appointed for life and because they can overrule both Congress and the President. They wield enormous power. To be on the Supreme Court means that you are one of the most powerful persons in the country. It is because of the Supreme Court ruling in the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that abortion on demand is deemed constitutional in the United States. And I will just interject this is not in my notes. Roe v. Wade would have never made it through Congress. It was a judiciary acting in place of Congress, legislating. That's why we have Roe v. Wade. Where do rights come from? Do they come from the governing authorities, Congress, the Supreme Court, or the President? If they do, then we are in a most perilous situation. We are little better than slaves. If Congress or the Supreme Court gives us our rights, then surely those same bodies in a fickle moment can take them away from us. Do our rights come from the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, or the United States Constitution? The answer to all of these questions is an emphatic no. Instead, our rights come directly from God, and therefore they are pre-political in nature. The founding fathers understood this. Our nation's most foundational document, the Declaration of Independence, explicitly teaches it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That one magnificent statement affirms the following. Number one, all people possess inalienable rights. That is rights that by definition do not change and cannot be taken away. Two, these inalienable or unchangeable rights are grounded in God the creator of every person. Thirdly, the first right, the right that is absolutely fundamental, is the right to life. This is what philosophers and theologians mean when they talk about pre-political rights. Every person has the right to life because life is an inalienable right given to us by Almighty God. And this means that no politician or Supreme Court justice or political party has the right to deny life to any innocent person, including the preborn child in the womb. 
politicians and justices are to recognize and honor these God-given rights. And yet, as we well know, the right to life is being denied every single day in this country. And the result of that denial is the death of some 60 million, million, 60 million pre-born children since 1973. We hear much talk today about a woman's constitutional right to have an abortion. What happened in the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision is that seven of nine Supreme Court justices denied the preborn child of his or her God-given right to life. In today's culture, the Bible is often dismissed as having little relevance to contemporary moral issues, in part because it contains antiquated laws that are no longer binding. Specific laws rooted in the Old Testament are strange to modern ears, and therefore the tendency is to reject the whole. The argument is often stated as follows. The Bible is full of unusual, seemingly irrelevant laws, and therefore modern men and women cannot be expected to submit to its commands. Parents, be warned. Some of your own children undoubtedly think this way. It is vitally important to distinguish between two types of laws found in Scripture. Number one, laws flowing from God's nature. Number two, laws given by God for a specific time and purpose. Understanding this distinction, we should not be surprised that some Old Testament laws, having fulfilled their purpose, have been set aside. Laws rooted in God's moral nature cannot change or be abrogated because God's holy nature cannot change. This means that the moral law of God is binding forever. The words, thou shalt not murder, are as true today as the day that God thundered them from Mount Sinai to the children of Israel in the Midianite wilderness. God has given us many rights, but he has never given anyone the right to kill the innocent unborn child. Instead, in Scripture, in Scripture, he speaks as follows. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keep watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his works? Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. We do not make the law of God and we are in no position to sit in judgment over it. We are called to submit to it. The Bible declares that every human being is created in the image of God, Genesis 1.26, and this means that every person from the moment of conception is created with worth and dignity. Nowhere in all of Scripture is this truth more eloquently proclaimed than in Psalm 139, which Dan Vanderstelt read to us earlier this morning. I'm going to make a couple of comments about that psalm. What first strikes the reader of Psalm 139 is its commitment to proclaiming the greatness of God, the transcendent majesty of God. The psalmist extols the majesty of God, and this causes the reader to exclaim, at least if our hearts are attuned with Bible, with Scripture, if we're listening to the Word of God speak to us, our hearts respond to that psalm this way, what a great God we have. There's no one like Him. This God provokes the psalmist, the psalmist to marvel, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there also. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. In these verses, the psalmist affirms the omnipresence of God or the infinity of God. The idea that God is present everywhere. And not simply present everywhere, he's present in fullness everywhere. There is no place where God is not. This means that God is present inside every Planned Parenthood abortion clinic, fully aware of what is secretly being done there. But there is more, much more. Not only does the psalmist affirm the transcendent of God, he's also filled with wonder as he contemplates God's active relationship with his creatures. This great transcendent God is also the God who forms life in the hidden place of the womb. So on the one hand, God is fierce and mighty. He is independent. He is authority. He is the king. And yet on the other hand, he is near. He is tender. He is compassionate. He is gentle. He is the master craftsman, silently at work in the womb, creating life with both wonder and skill. The most magical place in America is a woman's womb. Listen as the psalmist worships. And I would invite you to worship with him. Listen to these words as he contemplates this majestic, transcendent God who's also imminent and near and at work within the womb of a woman. David worships. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. The word earth here is being used as a metaphor for the womb. You plant a seed into the earth and it's amazing how it grows and it flowers and it's beautiful. In the same way, within the womb, life grows and it's beautiful. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. You see, this text teaches that God is the divine life-giving artist within the womb. If I were to exegete that passage, I would tell you that the Hebrew here is beautiful. It speaks of the language of knitting or crafting or tatting, of embroidery work. As God is viewed here as a master creator, a craftsman. Let me read you the words of an Old Testament scholar by the name of Ron Allen. Commenting on Psalm 139, he writes, The Bible never speaks of fetal life as mere chemical activity, cellular growth, or vague force. Rather, the fetus... Now, I'll just interject this thought. The word fetus, you know what it means? Historically, classically, it means young one. That's all it means. It means young one, as in young developing child. Brother, the fetus, the young one, in the mother's womb is described by the psalmist in vivid pictorial language as being shaped, fashioned, molded, woven together by the personal activity of God. That is, as God formed man from the dust of the ground, so he is actively involved in fashioning the fetus, the baby, in the womb. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? 
It's an extraordinary thought to realize that God is found in fullness in that place. And he's there creating. And it's wondrous. Understanding the times in which we live. A troubling malaise has settled upon this country. People today, especially young people, need to be awakened to the promise of America. Despite all of her flaws, the United States is an exceptional nation. And what makes it exceptional is the hope and the promise of her founding documents with their emphasis upon God-given pre-political rights. Today the focus, both in the mainstream media and in academia, is almost exclusively upon the nation's faults. The message being that America should be ashamed. That as Americans, we should be ashamed to be Americans. Many are convinced that the whole system needs to be burned to the ground. If you look at our history, slavery and its legacy are the nation's greatest blemishes. It is, of course, not a uniquely American blemish. Historians tell us that up to 50% of people living in the Roman Empire were slaves. The British Empire abolished the slave trade in 1807, and in 1834 ended slavery throughout the empire, largely through the influence of one evangelical Christian MP by the name of William Wilberforce. Have you heard of him before? You need to know about William Wilberforce. He is a hero. Gave his life to that one cause and was driven to do so because of his deep Christian convictions. The United States fought a great civil war to bring slavery to an end, a war that resulted in over 600,000 deaths. And while it is true that the North went to war to preserve the Union, it is equally true that slavery was the cause of that war and that the war brought about slavery's destruction. You see, what we so often fail to recognize is that the seeds of slavery's destruction were sown into our founding documents. Again, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. The founding fathers, some of whom, like Thomas Jefferson, were slave owners, planted these seeds, and in time, they bore fruit. The seeds of abortion's destruction are also embedded in these same documents. This country cannot forever endure as a free republic if it continues to deny, to deny life and liberty to the pre-born in violation of God's moral law and our founding documents. I am not ashamed to be an American. Although there are so many in our culture who seem to suggest that we should be ashamed of our country and its history. I am not ashamed to be an American and I do not believe that you should be either. I am, however, ashamed of the Supreme Court decision that allows for abortion because that decision denies life and liberty to the most innocent among us. Abortion is profoundly un-American. Abortion confronts this nation with one fundamental question. Will the United States respect the sanctity of every human life? Will we respect the sanctity of every citizen? On this issue, the stakes are high, and the differences between the two political parties could not be clearer. Take up the party platforms and read them. You can print them out. They're online. I have done so. 
take up the party platforms and read. The Republican Party platform protects the unborn, and the Democratic Party platform condemns the unborn to death. I don't think that's a statement with very much heat in it. I think it's a statement with a lot of light in it. What I have said is factually true. The two party platforms on this point could not be farther apart. One of them protects life, the other condemns life. The difference is stark. Republicans nominate people like Amy Coney Barrett to serve on the Supreme Court, and Democrats nominate people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Some would say we should never talk about politics. But this is so much bigger than politics. This is about the fundamental right of every person in this country to be respected and to have life. To not have his or her life simply snuffed out, erased as if it doesn't even matter. Judge Barrett's personal story trumpets her commitment to honor the sanctity of life. She's the mother of seven children, two of whom are adopted from Haiti. Her youngest biological child, Benjamin, has Down syndrome. I want to read you the words of Jim Daly. He writes of this woman and her background and her experience. At the very same time that the Barretts learned of Benjamin's prenatal diagnosis, they were told that the adoption of John Peter, which they thought was off, was actually back on. Now, if you've done international adoption, as I have, you know the truth of that statement. It was off and now it's back on. So now there's a Down syndrome child on the way, plus the whole issue of bringing a child from Haiti into one's home. The tragic Haitian earthquake of 2010 had exacerbated an already difficult humanitarian crisis. Did they still want to pursue the adoption? Needing to decide, Judge Barrett, then a university professor, walked to the cemetery on the Notre Dame campus on a cold winter's day where she sat on a bench pondering and praying. Looking across the aged snow-covered tombstones and grave markers, she thought, if life is really hard, at least it's short. It was then that she was overwhelmed with a convicting thought. What greater thing can you do than raise children? That's where you have the greatest impact on the world. Beloved, this is the kind of person we need on the Supreme Court. A justice who understands and honors the sanctity of every human life. Let's pray. Father God, we do pray for our country. I'm 51 years old, and, and I cannot remember in my lifetime a period like this one. The year 2020. What a strange and difficult year this has been. As we think about our own community here in Stanfield, it started with, with tremendous flooding in February. And then we had coronavirus begin in March, a pandemic. And then we've had the rioting, the protesting. Now we have a presidential election before us, and we know that regardless of who wins that election, it would seem that the nation is going to be torn into pieces simply because of this election. And I don't know how we all respond to this and how we deal with these difficult times, but I would think as people of faith, as Christians, 
we should ask the question, are you knocking on our door? Are you tapping us on the shoulder? Or are you speaking to us through all of this? Lord God, I know that we are desperately in need of you to be at work in our country, in our culture, in our state, in our county, in our communities. We know that you are the saving God. We know that you are the giving God. We know that you sent Christ into the world to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be reconciled to you, so we can be saved, so that we can be redeemed. We also know that you're a sovereign God. And so I pray this morning, Lord, that you would grant faith and repentance to many people. Lord God, we are Americans. We are proud of our country. We are thankful to be Americans. I'm quite convinced that if we could send so many of our citizens into the two-thirds world, it would change their thinking. They would recognize how exceedingly blessed they are to live in this country. And Lord God, because we care about our country and we love our country, we pray and we ask, Lord, that you would be merciful to us. So we commit all of this to you. And we do take great peace and great comfort in knowing that your sovereignty extends over all of these events. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've chosen what for me is a very unusual song for us to sing next. Um, I'll speak for just a moment on this. One area where I can get myself in a lot of trouble is that I am averse to mixing together patriotism and church. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't think that that is a wise thing to do. I am a patriotic American but I believe patriotism, for the most part, needs to be outside the walls of this building. Not all of you agree with me on that. I know that, and we've had some discussions about that. We are singing a song today that is more in that patriotic vein. Um, what is it called? My Country Tis of There's words in this song that I think are relevant to us. Let's sing this today. Would you please stand as we sing our closing song?
be seated.